All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of John chapter 10, please, this morning. John chapter 10. For the last several weeks, I've been talking to you and teaching you on the Holy Spirit. Everyone say the Holy Spirit. All right, and as we're learning about the Holy Spirit, there's a lot that we've already covered. And if you are joining us for the first time or if you're picked up from the middle of uh, uh, the series, I would really encourage you. All of the messages are available online. I would really encourage you to go back online and catch up with us because there's a lot of information uh, uh, that we have gone over already. Now, when it comes to the Holy Spirit and when it comes to today, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the practical relationship that you and I can receive from the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. All right. Remember, when you and I were created in the image and likeness of God, every single one of us were created with a purpose, a divine destiny from God, a divine purpose from God. A lot of times what happens is we uh, get caught up with all the various purposes and plans that are introduced into our lives, sometimes by our parents, sometimes by our culture, sometimes by our family and friends and other people that we begin to do life with. However, before those kinds of plans, before those purposes were introduced into your life, the most important person uh, that had a plan and had a purpose for your life was none other than God Almighty. All right. And so when he came up with the plan, when he came up with the purpose for your life and for your destiny, he did not mean for you to do it all by yourself. It's not like he had this great uh, uh, destiny for you and then he just leaves you to figure it out on your own. Even though he, he, he um, just as he came up with a plan and destiny for your life, in the same manner, he came up with the provision for you to be guided by God himself so that you reach that divine destiny that he has for your life. All right. Now, this was the case even before the fall. This was the case even when Adam and Eve were living in the garden. They always had access to God. And any time they had a question, any time they had a concern, they could simply go to the Father and begin to have a conversation with the Father regarding the things that they had concerns for. Now, after the fall, we know we lost our rightful place in the universe. And we went through thousands of years where there was this um, uh, on and off relationship with God and this battle or this struggle for man to have a consistent relationship with God Almighty. Now, we also know that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, by, uh, by Jesus coming into the world, uh, grace and truth came by Jesus, according to John 1, 17. And then through his death, burial and resurrection, now there is a new opportunity in the world where every single one of us can become a child of the Most High God. Now, once we become a child of the Most High God, Jesus said that even though he was going to leave us and leave this planet, he said, he made sure, he said, even though I leave you, I'm not leaving you helpless. Because he immediately says, I am sending you the Holy Spirit. Everyone say the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And one of the main reasons for sending the Holy Spirit is that he was going to be the helper. He was going to be the source of all help that we need in life. And without the help of the Holy Spirit, if we try to live out our life, uh, if we try to reach the divine destiny that God has for our lives, if we try to accomplish being a good father, being a good mother, being a good husband, uh, being a good employer, being a good employee, being a good student, whatever it is that you uh, are doing in life, whatever season of life you find yourself in, if you try to do those things without the help of the Holy Spirit. If you try to do those things without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you will be severely handicapped in life. All right? You'll be severely handicapped in life. Why? Because you're not using something that God intended for you to be using all the time. Does that make sense? All right? So he gave us the Holy Spirit, which is his own spirit, the spirit of the living God, so that we can have an ongoing relationship with him, an ongoing fellowship with him. All right. Now, John chapter 10, verse 27 says this. It says, but this is Jesus speaking. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and sorry. Uh, yeah, I know them and they follow me. Now, a lot of times, 
When it comes to uh, Christians and hearing the voice of God or being directed by God, being guided by God, the majority of Christians uh, tend to fall in the category of people saying, uh, you know, God never speaks to me or I can never hear the voice of God or I don't know what God is trying to tell me. I need to make an important decision, but I really don't understand why, why God is not making it obvious for me. Most Christians fall in that category. There are very few Christians who, are, who actually fall in the category that says, you know what, I prayed about this and this is what God is telling me to do. I, 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 you know, I was uh, confused about this decision in my life and God spoke to me and this is what I'm doing. And, 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 and because God guided me in this direction, I'm taking this decision, I'm moving in this direction. It's the minority of Christians who live their life that way. Most Christians just keep making decisions in their life and keep asking God to bless the decisions that they make. Are we understanding that? All right. We keep making decisions and then we just keep asking God to bless the decisions that we are already making in life. However, if and since, not if, but since the Holy Spirit was sent to be not only our helper, but to also be our guide. And we also saw that he, he was given to us to teach us all things. Then, if we're making decisions without the help of the Holy Spirit, that means we're setting ourselves up for failure. We're setting ourselves up for disappointment. We're setting ourselves up for pain. And pain, disappointment, and all of these things are, let, let me tag on this word, unnecessary pain, unnecessary disappointment. Are you understanding that? Why? Because if you take the help of the Holy Spirit, if you take the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then it would not be a problem. Now, here, once again, look at that verse. Jesus is saying here, the same Jesus that died on the cross for you, the same Jesus that you placed your faith in. He is saying, he says, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. Now, remember, everything in the kingdom of God operates by faith. Everything in the kingdom of God operates by faith. Now, if Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, that means by default and by definition, you have the ability to hear the voice of God. By default. So, as a new covenant believer, as a new creation, never start off from the place that says, I don't know how to hear the voice of God. I need to learn to hear the voice of God. That's not your position. Are you understanding that? That's not your position. By default, your position is that of a person who can hear the voice of God. Who can hear the voice of God. However, the reason why we don't start from that place is we don't know what it means to live by faith. So we keep living by natural senses. And because we don't hear the voice of God with these ears, we keep saying, I don't know. God is not speaking. God is not speaking. God is not speaking. But by definition, he says, my sheep hear my voice. Now, my sheep simply means his fold. It simply means everyone that is born again. So what he's saying is, my people, everyone that believes in me, everyone that follows me, they hear my voice. That means everyone that says, I'm a Christian. How many Christians do we have this morning? All right, majority of you, if not all of you. All right, every Christian, he says, they hear my voice. Say this out loud. Say, I can, I can hear, hear the voice of God. Come on, with conviction. I can hear, I can hear the, voice the voice of God. Now, that should be your confession every single time. Never ever say that you cannot hear the voice of God. But pastor, I've never heard it. Never ever say you cannot hear the voice of God. You hear me? Because when you... By definition, that's walking by faith. If you place your trust in Jesus, then you've also got to place your trust in his word. And he says you can hear his voice. So how do you actually get to the place where your mind, your soul agrees to the truth? 
The only way you get to the place where your soul agrees to the truth is by the Spirit of God. You agree with what He has said. And, and you say, see, just like w w the reason why we say, even if you are uh, sick in your body, even if you are feeling pain, even if the d medical uh, report is that uh, you have cancer in your body, you have uh, uh, high blood pressure or whatever the case may be. The reason why we say still confess the word of God over your life. The reason why we say continue to say that you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. Why? It's because you are agreeing with the truth. Rather than a simple fact. You're agreeing with the truth. So also, when it comes to hearing the voice of God, being guided by God in your life, you have to get to the place where, place where you say, I can hear the voice of God. I hear the voice of God. I hear the voice of God in my life. That needs to be the default position for every believer. All right. Now, once you understand that, let's go to uh, John 14, please. John 14. Hallelujah. John 14. Let's pick up in verse 16. All right. It says, and I will pray the, uh, pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Talking about the Holy Spirit, he says, he will, dwell, he will be with you and in you. Go with me to verse 26, same chapter. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. How many things? Come on, how many things? All things. He will teach you all things. Now, if he's going to teach you all things... And if you're going to have to live on a practical level with the Holy Spirit, that means you need to be a person that can discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. That means you need to be a person that can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. See, God, see, when Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, he was not going to send you the Holy Spirit and not give you the ability to hear the Holy Spirit. Think about that. If he's going to send the Holy Spirit, and not give you the ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, what good is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you understanding that? So, so this understanding or this notion of only holy people hear the voice of God, only pastors hear the voice of God, only special anointed people hear the voice of God, get rid of that idea. Get rid of that idea. Every one of you can hear the voice of God. Hallelujah. Every one of you can hear the voice of God. And so you, you need to unlearn certain things regarding being guided by God in life. See, because by default, you know what's happened? For many Christians, whenever they need to make a decision, by default, we've become so lazy. And because of wrong teaching, we've become so lazy that anytime you've got to make a decision, you simply tell your mother to pray. You simply tell your father to pray. Or you simply tell your pastor to pray about it. Pastor, pray about it and tell me if I should marry her. Pastor, tell me and pray about it. Well, I don't get that too much, but uh, because they already decided who to marry before they come to me. But, uh, um, um, you know, tell me which job I should take. Tell me if I should go to this country or not go. You know, why, why, why do I need to do your lifting? Now, is there a place for godly counsel? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not saying don't ever take godly counsel. But at the same time, don't relegate your responsibility on someone else. When you are a babe in Christ, it's okay to do that. But as you're maturing in God, if you've been coming to church for 10 years, and if you've been a Christian for more than one or two years, you need to be in a place where you are discerning and hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's gotten so bad in certain cases, we, there, there are Christians who have never even attempted to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. The only thing that they know is, ask someone, to, someone else to pray about it. Ask someone else to pray about it. And one of the reasons for that is because of wrong teaching as well. Because a lot of times, there have been things taken out of the Old Testament and because God used prophets in the Old Testament, God used priests in the Old Testament, people think even today, for every single thing, you've got to run to the priest and you've got to run to the prophet. You don't see that in the New Testament. 
You don't see that in the new covenant. How many of you understand we live under the new covenant? All right. So if you're living under the new covenant, that means the contract has changed. The terms of agreement have changed. And therefore, I'm, 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 I'm uh, um, uh, here to remind every one of you that you not only have a, a, uh, um, the opportunity to fellowship with the Holy Spirit, not only be in the presence of the Holy Spirit, but to actually hear Him. But to actually hear Him. All right? Go with me to uh, John 16. John 16. And... Verse 13, he says, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Everyone say guide. He will guide you into all truth. We've talked about the Holy Spirit in different terms, but today I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit in terms of him being a guide in your life. Him being a guide in your life. How many of you ever visited a historical monument or a, uh, while you're on vacation or even in our city? All right. When you go to a historical monument, usually one of the things that you see are guides that are available. All right. The reason why guides are available is so that you will get a full experience of the places you visit. Or you will get to know things about that place and about that environment that you would not know by just walking around in that place. Right? So the guide will take you to every nook and corner. He will tell you to observe things that you probably would not observe. He will give you information that you don't already know. That's the point of the guide. And here he says, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. That means not only truth that pertains to the message that you hear or a book that you read or, or, or spiritual things. That means he will guide you into the truth of that business deal that you're about to get into. He's going to guide you into that person that, that you are head over heels about and you are, you're, you're moving in a direction and you're thinking, okay, this is the one I'm going to get married, even though your friends tell you that it's not the greatest idea, even though there are people in your life that are go telling you, hey, she's not the best one, she's not the right, right one for your uh, uh, life, he's not the right person, he's got some bad habits, but you're not caring, you're not listening. But if you pay attention to the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth regarding that person. He will guide you into all truth regarding decisions that you will make in life. Are you understanding that? So he says, he will guide you into all truth. Now, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So again, Jesus said, we, we saw in, in the beginning, we saw that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. And here now he's saying when the Holy Spirit comes, he's just not going to speak things on his own authority, but he's only going to speak the things that he is supposed to speak to you and to me. Then he says, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Verse 14, he will glorify me and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the father has are Mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. All right. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm trying to cover a lot of ground today. So we need to be quick. So Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. All right. Romans 8 and 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the... Sons of God. For as many as are led by the Holy Spirit, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but that you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. All right. Now, what, what, uh, last week I told you about the word witness. Now, this witness of the Holy Spirit that the Bible is talking about, this witness of the Holy Spirit with your spirit is the inward witness. Okay? Inward witness. It's not an outward witness, but an inward witness. Okay? Now, um, in a courtroom, you've got a witness 
and they confess to certain things, they agree to certain things, or they, they uh, give some information regarding certain things. And when they do, that's a witness that you see on the outside and that you hear on the outside. But now, here he says, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit man, right? So now, where is the Holy Spirit of God? On the inside. Now, where is your spirit? On the inside of your flesh, right? So the, the witness that is taking place is not on the outside, but on the inside. And therefore, it's the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. Now, once you understand that it is the inward witness, here's what you need to stop doing. You need to stop looking for outward witness. Now, I know that sounds basic, but that's very important. If the Holy Spirit is present on the inside, stop looking for evidence on the outside. If the Holy Spirit is on the inside, stop looking for evidence on the outside. If the Holy Spirit is not going to give witness to your flesh or to your body, if he's not going to bear witness with your soul or your mind, but if he's going to witness to your, come on, to your, come on, to your, to your spirit, then you've got to be paying attention to your, to your spirit man. And therefore, it's the inward witness. So step number one, you've got to understand that in order to be guided by the Holy Spirit in your life, don't look for outward signs. Don't look for outward signs, but look inward. Look inward. Now, for the unbeliever, you don't look inward because you don't have a lot going on inside. Okay, I'm not talking about some self-help or all the power is within you. You are the great I am. No, you are. Okay, control. I was almost about to say something I would regret later. All right. You're nothing. All right. Let me just stop there. You're nothing. Okay. The only reason the new covenant believer is something is because the Holy Spirit of God resides on the inside of you and you've been made a new creation. You've been made a new creation. And therefore, for the Christian, it is perfectly right to look inward. It's perfectly right to look inward. For the unbeliever, not so. Not so, because you're not born again by the Spirit of God. All right. Now, here he goes on to say, all right, so that's the inward witness. Now, this is the primary way that we are led and by, guided by the Spirit of God under the new covenant. Under the new covenant. Okay. Now, the Word of God is our primary guide. But now, when it comes to being uh, uh, led by the Spirit of God, all right, that's what I'm talking about. By, when it comes to being guided by the Spirit of God, the primary way He's going to lead us and guide us and teach us is by the inward witness. Is by the inward witness. That's the number one way He will lead you, guide you, and teach you. Okay, um, again, He's not going to bear witness with your soul, neither your body. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs 20 and verse 27 says this. It says, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. Some translations will say is the candle of the Lord. Searching all the inward uh, depths of his heart. Other translations, the King James will say, searching the inward parts of his belly. It's the same thing where it says uh, um, in, in the New Testament where it says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It's the same context that is being used. All right. So here he says, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. All right. So which means the spirit of man is what you need to use to search out things. The lamp. Is, the, is what you use. It's the light bulb that you use to search out things when things are dark. When you need to make a decision, when you're confused, that's darkness. All right. When you're confused about decisions that you need to make and you, you don't know what to do, that's darkness. And here he says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Once again, that means that lets us know that you've got to look inward and not outward. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Again, understand this, that man is a tripart being. Man is a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a 
physical body, all right? Man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a physical body. Spirit, soul, and body combined make the man. Spirit, soul, body combined make the man. You are not a body, but you live in a body. You are not a soul, but you are spirit who possesses or has a soul. All right. Now, Philippians chapter one. Let's make sure that we understand this clearly. Philippians chapter one, verse 23 says this. This is Paul speaking and he says, for I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's saying, I'm hard pressed with this decision that I've got to make. He says, and the decision that I have to make, go back. Verse 23. He says, for I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. To depart and be with Christ. That means he's saying to depart from the body, but he's not talking in terms of being dead. He's saying, I can depart from the body and be with Christ. That means he's still talking about being alive. So he's saying, this flesh that I've got, I can depart from it. I can leave my flesh and I can go on and live with Christ. Which means you are not your body, but you are a spirit being. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, Verse 16, it says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Now, what's the inward man? The inward man is none other than the spirit man, right? The inward man is being renewed day by day. Now, since we know that we are a spirit, we have a soul and we live in a physical body, the challenge when it comes to the inward witness is that we have never taken the time to develop the inward man and when it comes to uh, uh, discerning the inward man, all right? For example, from the time you were born, you lived in this world according to your five physical senses, all right? So how do you know uh, that you've got a fever? I'm feeling hot. And therefore, I know I have a fever, all right? Uh, uh, how do you know that something uh, uh, struck your leg? It's because you, you get pain and then you realize, oh, wait a minute, somebody stepped on me. And, and so that pain is how you hear your body. You understand that, all right? So you feel certain things. You feel pain, you feel hot, you feel cold, all right? And that pain or that feeling is the voice of the body, all right? It's the voice of the body. Now, when it comes to your mind, your will, your emotions, your decision maker, reasoning is the voice of the mind. Reasoning is the voice of of the mind. Now, and many of us, we've reasoned throughout our lives. Okay, I'm going to buy this and not buy that. Why? Because you have a reason for that. Uh, I'm I'm going to go here and I'm not going to go there. Why? You have a reason for that. I'm going to talk to this person. I'm going to stay away from this person. Why? You have a reason for that. So you make decisions based on reasonings. All right. Now, reasonings, all right, or reasons are the voice of the soul. You cannot see your soul, but you've got a soul. All right. You cannot see your soul, but you have a soul. And, and, the, and, 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 and that's the, the reasonings are the voice of the soul. Now, however, after we are born again, last week we saw that we know that we are children of God because of the witness of the Holy Spirit. But. After we experience the witness of the Holy Spirit, many of us, we never practice discerning that inward witness when it comes to other areas of our life. So what has happened is we've experienced the inward witness of the Holy Spirit in our lives when it comes to salvation. But then we stopped looking for that inward witness when it has to come when it, uh, when it comes to making other decisions in life. And therefore, because you don't practice it long enough, you feel like you have a hard time discerning the voice of God, discerning the leading of God, discerning the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life. You understand that? All right. So when it comes to the body, feelings, they're the voice of the body. When it comes to the soul, reasoning is the voice of the soul. But when it comes to your spirit, 
is the conscience. Your conscience is the voice of the Spirit. Your conscience is the voice of the Spirit. Right? When it comes to, um, a lot of people will say things like, um, after something has happened in their life, I just knew I should not have done that. Something told me not to buy that. Something told me, I just had this feeling of, I should not go to that place. Something told me I should go to that place. Something told me I should have called that person. Something told me I should have, I should not have invested my money. I should have believed that person. I should not have believed that person. Now, a lot of times we say those things after the fact that we have experienced some negative situation in our lives. Now, the question is, what was that knowing or sense that you had on the inside? That before you made that decision, there was a knowing, there was a leading, there was a guiding on the inside that said, don't trust that person. Don't trust that person. And yet, even though you felt that deep down on the inside, you had that knowing, but maybe you did not want to be embarrassed by people, or maybe you did not want to look bad in front of people, or whatever the case, because of the pressure, you went ahead. Against your conscience. You made a decision against your conscience. Why? Because a lot of times we give more weight to feelings and reasonings more than conscience. Right? Keep that in mind or write that down. A lot of times we give more weight to reasonings and feelings more than we give weight to conscience. The primary way you begin to develop this knowing that you're being led by God is to elevate the place of conscience in your life rather than feelings and reasonings. Rather than reasonings and feelings. Because when you keep giving, you know, uh, 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 you know I, I had this sense, Pastor, that I should not go with them. Uh, but, you know, I already gave my word and I already said that I will come there. And so, uh, you know, I didn't want them to feel bad and didn't want them to think of me as a bad person. And the list goes on and on and on. You know, I knew I should not have given them that loan. I knew I should not have given them that money, but I didn't want them to think bad of me. But they were my childhood friends. And so the, your, your conscience is crying out to you, but you had a reason, you had a feeling, and you gave more weight to that feeling, you gave more weight to that reasoning, and therefore your conscience was quenched. It was silenced. And therefore you went ahead against your conscience. And the reality is many of us make decisions against our conscience than with or in agreement with our conscience. Because we are more, we are more um, concerned about our image in front of others than going with the leading of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Spirit, which is our conscience. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. Now, why is this the case? 2 Corinthians 5.17, well-known scripture says, therefore, if anyone's in, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. Now, there are Christians who, who, who have a problem because, uh, uh, for a, uh, example, Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful above all. All right. So um, some of the Christians, they, they have a hard time with uh, um, the inward witness because they say, how can you believe the inward witness or how can you go with your conscience when your heart is deceitful above all? The reason why you can go along with what your heart is telling you is because all things have been made new. Once again, everything that I'm telling you today specifically applies to the born again believer. Everything I'm telling you today specifically applies to the person who's placed their faith in Christ and he's become a new creation. If you are not a new creation, yes, your heart is deceitful and wicked above all. But once you're made a new creation, your heart is not deceitful. Right? You've been made new. All things have been made new. Since your spirit is born again and made new, the voice of the spirit becomes your safe guide in life. Because you are born again. Now, what part of you is born again, by the way? It's the spirit man. 
So the one part that you can depend upon for sure is not your body or your soul, but your spirit man. Because it's the one thing that has completely been created afresh and anew. And the voice of the spirit becomes your safe guide in life. Jeremiah 31 and verse 33. Here's what he says. He says, uh, but this is the covenant I will make with them, um, with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them and on their hearts will I write it. Now, this is not for old covenant. David did not have this. Daniel did not have this. The prophets of old, Elisha and Elijah did not have this opportunity. Elijah was not led by the inward witness. David was not led by the inward witness. You know why? Because none of them had the work of God internally. But you and I have the work of God done internally. And therefore he says, I will, um, I will put my law within them and on their hearts I will write it. This mean, that means your spirit knows things that your mind has to yet uh, catch up to. Your spirit man knows things that your mind needs to catch up to. There's truth and information in the spirit that you don't, your mind does not even comprehend at this point. And this is one of the reasons why speaking in tongues is so very important. And I'll talk about it in the next two weeks. All right. And this is why speaking in tongues gives you access to that wisdom that is deep down on, on the inside of the spirit man. All right, go with me to Romans 5 and verse 5. Romans 5, 5 says this. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who, has, uh, who was given to us. The love of God has been poured out where? Not in your mind, not in your body. The love of God has been poured out in your hearts, which is the spirit man. So the, the, all the new creation is in the spirit. The law of God has been written on our hearts, which is the spirit. And the love of God has been poured out where? In our hearts. Which means the, the love of God. That means God himself has been poured out in your heart, in your spirit, man. And now you've got the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of you. So the safest guide in life. Is the spirit man. That's the safest guide. If the love of God has been poured out in your hearts. The inward witness will never tell you to take revenge on somebody. The inward witness will never tell you to harm somebody. You understand that? Why? Because the love of God has been poured out. The inward witness will never tell you to stay away from God. The inward witness will never tell you to stop reading the Bible for a few days. The inward witness will never tell you to do some drugs for a few days. Why? Because the laws of God, the law of God has been written on your heart in the, in the, in, in the spirit man. So everything that he leads you and guides you will always be in agreement with who God is. Do we understand that? All right. Hebrews 4. Let's go there quickly. Hebrews 4. And verse 12. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. It says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and the spirit. So for anyone that thinks that soul and spirit are the same thing, they're not. They're not. They're two different things. However... One of the questions that I uh, uh, often get asked is, Pastor, I, I have this uh, um, sense in my heart, you know, uh, I, I believe I need to go in this direction. I believe I need to make this decision. But how do I know if it is God or how do I know if it's myself? How do I know if it's God or how do I know if it's just me? Here is the answer. Here he says that the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between the soul and spirit, between the joint and marrow, it exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. So when you're not sure, then you go back to the word of God. 
You go back to the word of God. And as you read the word of God and as you meditate on the word of God, he, the word of God even divides between the soul and the spirit. It, it says he makes the, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So he will expose, the word will expose and let you know whether it's a godly desire or whether it's your own fleshly desire. He will let you know whether you're going uh, to take the job sincerely for the sake of your family or just for your pleasure. He will let you know every desire and innermost intent that you have before you make the decision. So you depend on the inward witness, but anytime you are confused about things, you always go back to the Word of God because the Word of God will separate even your soul and your spirit man. Now, this doesn't happen by just you opening the Bible and just reading a verse and saying, I'm done. No, this happens by you meditating on the Word of God. Meditating on the Word of God. And as you meditate on the Word of God, that meditation process will separate the desires of the soul and the desires of the spirit man. And through that separation, you will be able to make the decisions that you're supposed to make in life. Now think about this. How much drastically or how drastically would our lives change if we start depending on the Holy Spirit the way we're supposed to before we make decisions? And that's the key word, before. Before. Not after, not simply going by our desires and then saying, God, please bless, God, please bless, God, please bless. Not going ahead with that loan and then not able to pay the loan and now saying, God, I need a miracle, God, I need a miracle, God, I need a miracle. No, you would not need a miracle if you have first depended on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. God, heal this relationship, heal this relationship, heal this relationship. If you have taken the time to think about the relationship before you got into the relationship, you would not have to get through the process of healing from the relationship. Are you understanding what I'm saying? See, this is why I said there's a lot of unnecessary pain, unnecessary disappointment unnecessary tragedies that we go through life. Simply thinking, we know best. Simply by thinking, we know best. I remember a, uh, um, a, a story of a, a pastor who was uh, at one time with his family and they, they went to a restaurant to sit down and eat. They sat down and they ordered food. And after they ordered food, they're just waiting on the food. And while they're waiting on the food, the pastor has this urge on the inside that they need to rush home. They need to rush home. Now, the kids are there. His wife is there. But he's got this urge. I, I, I just need to rush home. I need to rush home. I need to rush home. So finally, he, he, he thinks about it. He says, you know, I don't want my kids to be disappointed. I don't want, I don't want my wife to be disappointed. I don't want uh, uh, the waiter or the waitress, whoever uh, uh, waited on us to uh, think that we are weird, that we ordered the food and not eat the food and not even wait for the food, but then just leave. But then finally, he says, you know what? We've got to leave. He tells his wife, kids, come on, guys, we need to go. They pack up, get into the car and they rush home. And just as they rush home, as they open the door, this, was, this happened in, the, uh, in America, and they had a heater in their house. Whatever, uh, 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 something went wrong with the heater, and the heater caught on fire. And they were just back in time in the house so that they could put the fire out. But if they would have been delayed in coming, their entire house would have been burned down. Their entire house would have been burned down. Now... The reason I'm giving you that example is he did not run when he saw smoke. See, that's outward witness. The reason I'm giving you that example is he followed the inward witness. And, and every one of us have the responsibility of practicing paying attention to that inward witness. Paying attention to the conscience. When your conscience tells you 
to do something, to not do something, to go somewhere, not to go somewhere. Pay attention to your conscience. Pay attention to your conscience. Be more attentive to the conscience that God has given you than the feelings of your body or the reasonings of your mind. All right, go with me to Acts chapter 27 and we'll close with this. Acts 27. And I'll give you an example from the life of Paul. Acts 27 and verse 9. It says, Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end up with disaster and much loss, not only for the cargo and ship, but also our lives, but also our lives. Now, many of you know, Paul the Apostle was a man that would travel extensively. He used to travel all the time preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, he's on one of his trips and here's what he says. He says, men... I perceive. Now that's what I want you to pay attention to. He doesn't say, men, listen what God told me. He didn't say that. And that's where we miss it. That's where we miss it. He didn't say, God told me to tell you. That's where we miss it. And by the way, this business of God told me to tell you, be careful with that stuff. Be careful with that stuff. Because most of it is nonsense. Most of it is nonsense. Alright? Most of it. And the only reason why you become gullible to it, the only reason why you believe every person that comes and says, God told me to tell you is because you have no confidence in the fact that you can hear and discern the voice of God for yourself. There, there need to be a few select group of people in your life. A few, not many, a few that you say, I trust them. And when they talk to me, I pay attention. When they say something, when they say they perceive certain things, when they say, I believe God is telling you to do this, then you obey. But you've got to have a small group of people in your life. Not anybody that can just walk up to you and say, hey, brother, God told me. No, no, no. Be careful with that stuff. Be careful with that stuff. Too many people have made decisions in life because somebody else told them, God told me to tell you. Too many, too many. Be careful with that, All right? So now Paul says, men, I perceive that this voyage will end in disaster. I perceive. That's simply another way of saying, I've got a witness. Not on the outside, but on the inside. I have a witness that this is going to happen. I have a witness. The question is, what do you have a witness for in life? About that decision that you're about to make. About the direction that you're about to go in. What witness do you have? I'm not asking what salary they're going to pay you. I'm not asking how beautiful she looks. What's the inward witness? What's the voice of your conscience telling you? What's the voice of your conscience telling you? I'm not asking you how much money they promised you in return for what you are going to invest in them. I'm saying, what is your conscience telling you? Not what the news reporter said, not the financial expert and guru projected for the next year. I'm saying, what is your conscience saying? Pay attention to it. Everyone might be doing one thing, but pay attention to the conscience. Pay attention to your conscience. Pay attention to your conscience. You know, when we were kids, um, I think at some point everyone heard this dialogue. Um, I don't know and in many cases, that's what Christians do. That's what we do. Oh, everyone's doing it, Pastor. 
Everyone's going in that direction. Everyone's becoming an engineer. Everyone's investing in that company. Everyone is moving to America. So sure. Am I saying becoming an engineer is wrong? No. Am I saying uh, investing in a company is wrong? No. Am I saying moving to America is wrong? No. But just because everyone's doing it does not mean you need to do it. You understand that? Just because everyone is doing it does not mean you need to do it. Pay attention to the conscience. Because here, every one of us have been created for greatness in life. No exceptions. Every one of us were created to have dominion in life. Every one of us were created to receive and experience the abundant life that Jesus came to give. But remember, even though the death, burial and resurrection, even though Jesus paid the price for our eternal salvation and paid the price for our abundant living here on the earth, it is through the guidance of the Holy Spirit that we will experience that in life. I once uh, heard another story of uh, another pastor. Um, this time it was him and his wife. And uh, uh, they were traveling. And one day they got up. Uh, they, got into, they got out of the hotel. They got into the car. And uh, they started their journey. And they got into a terrible accident. And they got sued because of that. And they had to go through surgeries. A lot of money lost. All kinds of complications. And, and the pastor always had this question, like, why did God allow this to happen? Why did God do this to me? And, well, you know, uh, we, were going, we were doing everything right. I'm a pastor. I'm blah, 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 blah. And then once they started really thinking about what had taken place, they once went to a pastor and said, why did God do this? Why did God allow this? And the pastor started asking some questions. And, and one of the things that this pastor said was, he said, well, that morning we woke up and we even made our confessions. We confess that God protects. We confess that the angels are, of God are surrounding us. But then as the longer they started to talk and the more questions that man began to ask him, he said, you know what? We were having breakfast. And while we were having breakfast that day in the hotel before we left, I just had a sense that we should have said uh, that we should wait in the lobby for another 10 minutes. That we should wait in the lobby for another 10 minutes before we leave. I don't know why, but I just felt like we needed to wait for 10 minutes. But he said, I looked at the clock and I felt like if we start early, we can get to our destination faster. And we just started the journey. And one of the questions he had was, but I made my confessions. I spoke Psalm 91. Why is it that the angels did not protect? Now remember, the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth it does not negate the word of God but at the same time if you do not rely on the presence of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life then you are foolish for not doing so and therefore it's not just enough to know the word it's very important to know the word but it is more important or equally important let me say it that way it is equally important to be led by the Spirit of God in life. To be guided by the Holy Spirit. To pay attention to the voice of the Spirit, which is your conscience. Amen. Amen. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that the Word of God has been a blessing to you. Now, no matter where you're joining us from, if you are ever in the Hyderabad area, I would invite you and I would love to see you at New City Church at one of our services. If you live anywhere in or around Hyderabad and Secunderabad, why don't you make plans to come and join us at New City Church? You'll, you'll experience the presence of God, you will hear the Word of God, and you will be able to receive the things that God has destined for your life. Remember, we love you, we're praying for you, and we would love to see you here at New City Church. God bless.